my neighbor knocked on my door very aggressively and said, Shirley, get out here. And um, I said, what's going on, Karen? And she said, Santa Rosa is burning down. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. We got into the helicopter and it, the winds were blowing 40 to 50 miles an hour. Um, there was smoke and fire everywhere. All I could do was look and say to Mike Thompson, our congressman who had been in Vietnam, it looks like a war went on down there. It looks like a bomb. And he kept turning to me and saying, yeah, that's what it looks like, but it's actually worse. Hard to talk about still. Those first few days were so hard. We didn't sleep much. We worked all the time. The night of October 8th, we had a windstorm, and that windstorm led to 17 different fire starts across this landscape all around Santa Rosa. Those 17 fires sort of rushed into each other and became two main large fire events. Stoplights were out, the power was out, people did not know which direction to go. It was really chaotic. There are close to about 20 fires that are scorching hundreds of thousands. Thousands of, of firefighters have been unable to cross eight counties and hundreds more people seven. are missing. It traveled 16 miles in an instant, it seemed like. It just came roaring over the hills. I've seen a lot uh, of forest fires, but I had fire never fire. seen anything like this before. It was, it was um, otherworldly. The wildfire issue has become intense in the United States, and it's gotten so much worse over the last 10 and 15 years, it's startling. We've had years and years of drought here in California, and there's no doubt it's gotten hotter and windier, and those conditions are, are ripe for wildfires, which now turn into urban fires, it turns out. There are more people in harm's way and the harm is getting worse. So I think people are starting to realize that we have a crisis on our hands. I think it could very likely happen again here. That's part of the sadness of all of this is that we all want to rebuild and recover. And yet we still live with these tremendous risks. These wildfires are increasingly becoming an urban phenomenon. I mean, this, to me, you couldn't illustrate it more than this. We're not up in the hills, you know, we're in downtown Santa Rosa. The fire blew into Santa Rosa in the early morning hours. I think it was about four in the morning. I know people in this neighborhood who got the warning, looked out, saw a wall of flame, got in their car, escaped, and four minutes later, their house was on fire. So that's how rapidly the fire moved through here. We've increasingly encroached our communities into these landscapes where we have removed fire and grazing from a lot of the landscape. And so the shrub layer has built up, the grasses have built up, and now when fire does come, it's a conflagration. We've been suppressing fire here for so long that you could live here for an entire generation and have never seen an event like happened last year. So it's in that beginning stages of a learning curve culturally here. My biggest struggle is helping people understand that landscapes have always been actively managed by indigenous people and that we have a need to steward our parks and open spaces and that that will make them safer and it will also restore habitats both for wildlife and for our forests. We need to be burning, we need to be thinning, and that's a big lift. A lot of people have deep skepticism about that. If 
fire is only one tool in the box, right? So one thing we're doing is trying to ramp up our sheep and goat gra grazing program, really get those critters out there browsing down the shrub layer. The second tool is mechanical treatment, you know, so going in there hand cutting. But by far the cheapest tool in the box is prescribed fire. So to the degree to which we as land managers can get the public comfortable with prescribed fire, we'll be able to do a lot more acres for a lot fewer dollars. And that's kind of the goal. Yeah. Nice, to see you. nice to see you. All right, this is my daughter, Hi, Kira. Nice to, meet you. nice to meet you. Come on in. This is beautiful. Thank you so much. And Marty. Marty Roberts. Good to meet you. My goal tonight is to make sure that if you have any questions or you feel like you're going to get tough questions, I can help you answer them, right? So basically, the, the ballot measure is roughly carved into three buckets safety, access, and then the third is my favorite because natural resources, so protecting the environment. And for everyone in this room, what I want you to understand is that this is a game changer for us. If we get this ballot measure, this little thing that I stood up called the Natural Resource Division at Sonoma County Regional Parks, which is mighty but small, will really be real. I mean, we will have the funds to do A lot of what I do project. is looking at these landscapes and trying to figure out how do we restore the natural process. Let's make sure that we get prescribed fire back in our toolbox in this part of the world, which is my goal because that actually draws down the fuel loads and helps protect our neighboring towns and communities. By the time I was eight years old, I discovered that in fact, there was a profession called forestry and they paid people to actually go out and spend time in the woods. And I decided right then that's what I wanted to do and that I wanted to work for the Forest Service. The mindset of the forester in mid 20th century was very much that uh, forests were a collection of trees that you managed to produce wood. In the post-World War II era, there was tremendous pressure on the Forest Service to increase the timber harvest on federal lands in order to provide the wood that was needed to build all the homes for the veterans that were coming back and starting their lives over again. The agency sort of went over to the dark side and through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the timber harvest just continued to go up. Yeah, I'm, I'm a history buff, and certainly World War II history because I was a kid growing up right in the middle of it, so anyway. Up until the 70s and 80s, science had all been oriented towards uh, how do we manage forest lands to produce trees as a crop. And nobody had done any significant research at all on what was the nature of these forest ecosystems. So all of the pre-World War II period was devoted very much to creating a forest service that could detect and suppress fire. The real mistake was made, which was to assume all fire was bad and all fire should be put out. It was particularly effective in areas that uh, had historically had a lot of fire, frequent fire. They had very low levels of accumulation of fuels. They had forest structures that were very resistant to fire, but in order to maintain those kinds of conditions, fire needed to be allowed to continue. And we didn't allow that. The fuels began to accumulate. The structure of the forest changed. Fuel-filled forests would now be consumed by the fire. Historically, in these fire-frequent landscapes, 
The fires were often very large, but they weren't intense. Our problem today is that we have large, intense fires. In the Intermountain West and the Sierra Nevada, we're talking about millions of acres that need treatment. Now, at the same time, there were other forests, like our Douglas fir hemlock forest on the west side of the Cascades, that the fire suppression policy didn't change their fundamental nature. These were forests that didn't burn frequently. These are the, the really classic forests of the coastal Pacific Northwest. Very high productivity, lots of down wood. Uh, and of course, all of this organic material represents fuels. They have a very different kind of relationship with fire than the forests that are in the dry part of the country, the frequent fire forests. The appropriate strategy for a forest like this is to, in fact, be very aggressive about detecting and suppressing fires so that fire doesn't get into this sort of a forest. And the neat thing about that is suppressing fire in this forest isn't going to make it unnatural. Uh, these forests are used to going for hundreds of years without fire. This one is, is doing things on a scale that defy our ability to modify greatly. We need to understand and respect these environments. I was born in Oregon, studied forestry at Berkeley, and then I was planning on a career working for the Forest Service as a silviculturist. And unfortunately, the year that I graduated was a year that the bottom fell out of the timber market and I feel very fortunate that I landed my current job with the Wilderness Society. And uh, that was 26 and a half years ago, so. <laughs> There was an erosion of trust in the agency's commitment to non-timber resources. Policies of the Forest Service rewarded timber management above all other resources on the national forest. And through the 60s and 70s was leading to an intentional elimination of old growth, which was considered to be slow growing and not an ideal resource for forestry. And foresters had been so successful at that that there was very little old growth left. Wow. You just don't see this kind of board anymore. This is a coast redwood board cut from a single tree in 1940. I bet this place hasn't changed in 50 years. <laughs> Amazing. My name's Susan Jane Brown, and I'm a staff attorney and Wildlands Program Director for the Western Environmental Law Center. I got involved in forest environmental issues uh, when I came to Oregon in 1997 to attend Lewis and Clark Law School and wanted to practice environmental law. I had never seen old growth forests before. And you hear people talk about how there are these cathedral forests and it definitely feels that way. It's good to be humbled by a place like that. Particularly here in the Northwest, there's a lot of old growth logging. 
depending on who you talk to, between two and 5% of those native forests are still left. They need all the help that we can give them. I felt that that was really my calling. That was what I wanted to do. I wanted to protect those places. Certainly legal work is really challenging because at the end of the day, somebody wins and somebody loses. And if you don't win, you know, the, the implication is that a special place is, is lost. Back in the 70s and 80s, we were harvesting billions of board feet every year off of the forests in Oregon and Washington alone. You can only do that for so long before the ecosystem starts to give out, and that's exactly what started to happen. It wasn't sustainable. Once the scientists started detecting changes in wildlife populations, including the spotted owl, people kind of put two and two together and realized that the disappearance of old growth forests was leading to the potential extinction of species, and that drove environmentalists to act. The trust that the agency lost, the public trust, was substantial and they're still trying to come back from that. So when the agency says, oh, just trust us, don't worry, it's like, no, I don't trust you. I remember logging without laws, no. Just like the Amazon, you know, once you cut it down to a level, it's gone. I spent 18 years in the sawmill business and they're toying with my life. Over time, as we learn more about these forests, and as Congress learn more about these forests, the tide turned. Too much was being lost in this very aggressive pursuit of converting the national forests to timber farms. Bill Clinton directed that a team be assembled to facilitate an economic transition away from large amounts of old growth logging toward a community economy that could be sustained at a lower level of logging. And then that became the Northwest Forest Plan, which designated a series of large, protected, mostly old growth areas across the Cascade Mountain Range and west in Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. And that sort of set off dominoes across the national forest system. Harvest on the national forests fell by an order of magnitude in just a few years. Well, we come here in 1945. And then in 65, I quit the Forest Service, partnered with my folks, and uh, run the store. We had anywhere from two to three hired help that was on the floor with us at most time. And we run from about seven o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at night. When we locked the store down, this was the liquor store. And over here in this section, we wrote game licenses. And I do miss the people that you used to do because there was all kinds of people. They were nice people. And you can, they were interesting and whatever else. But the rigmarole you had to put up with, with the government, I don't miss that. They marked off that timber up there as old growth timber. Can't log it, you can't do anything with it, and it's old growth. When the sawmills quit out and the logging quit, then I couldn't make enough money to pay hired help. So that lost a lot of population. Then they shut the forest service down. That lost some more population. And so we're, we're down to probably, I don't know, 60, 80 people. I don't know what the logic is, but basically it's government. Government logic. Hi, Brenda. Hi, Hi Brett. Hi, How's clerking you? going? My name is Mark Webb. I'm currently executive director for Blue Mountains Forest Partners. Before that, I was Grant County judge for one term, six years. I do remember one time, uh, Commissioner Britton and I were at a meeting with State Fire Marshal and some other folks out of Monument, and uh, I was new to office then, and uh, State Fire Marshal had misled me on something, and I went over the 
the desk to get him. <laughs> and uh, Commissioner Britton pulled me down. So that's probably what I remember most. I was ready for something. Before collaborative involvement, the environmental community really didn't appreciate what we were trying to do in Grant County or our respect from the landscape. And there was a lot of animosity or distrust. Well, I was skeptical that there was compromise possible. I started doing east side timber sale work when I was still in law school. As long as I could remember, there had been at least three mills going here, Prairie Wood Products, Grant Western, and uh, Malheur Lumber. And both Grant Western and Malheur Lumber were big log mills, so they took old growth. I'd done a bunch of litigation. We'd shut down the Malheur's timber program, so there really just wasn't anything happening. And that worked fine for me. When you shut down an industry, and it's about the only industry that provides a livelihood here, you're pretty upset, and it's hard to talk. It was an interesting time. It was very challenging. My first trip to Grant County, I brought somebody with me because I wasn't sure that my safety was assured. I didn't meet Susan Jane until a former county commissioner that I served with, Boyd Britton, had a federal lawsuit. And uh, as Boyd would do, he wanted to know who was shutting us down. Somebody pointed him to Susan Jane, and he went over and asked if we couldn't do things differently, essentially, and invited her out. I met Mark Webb for the first time in 2004, maybe. Well, I know what Mark thought of me. <laughs> Mark thought I had horns and a tail. That was what Mark thought. You know, I was a lawyer, and I'm a liberal female from Portland coming into his community to tell him what to do. The impetus for being out there was a bad fire season in 2002. We had a lot of big fires in Oregon. Those sorts of occurrences were becoming more and more common. Whereas every you know, decade or so, you'd have a bad fire year. It was now every four or five years, and then it was every two or three years. And now it's pretty much every year. That the only reason industry and the environmental community came together at all is because neither had an option anymore. SJ and others had essentially shut down the logging industry. And they were desperate for wood, and they were willing to take anything they could get as long as they got some more wood. Fortunately for us, the environmental community was also coming to appreciate that while they might have saved the old growth trees from the timber industry, they were beginning to lose them increasingly to catastrophic wildfires, fires that would have been unnatural in the landscape in the past. And so they were confronted with the challenge of having to address that through active management, which they've been spending a lot of time shutting down. This problem is not abstract. There are a few places where people have taken aggressive action to reduce the fuels around their homes and around communities, and those places are definitely much better off. But at the larger scale, the fuel buildup continues, the climate continues to worsen, making it warmer, lowering relative humidities, perhaps even causing changes in wind patterns and precipitation. And now we have more extreme fire weather when we get it. The problem that we have in the U.S. right now is that we put out every fire that we can, so we only get fire behavior associated with fires we can't put out. That means that the majority of the fire that we get is high severity fire that burns in a way that we don't want. And then more and more people are living in the wildland urban interface, the place where wildland fuels come in contact with homes. And so there are more people in harm's way and the harm is getting worse. My dad's family's been here since the 1850s. So his father, grandfather, grandmother, great grandmother, they're all raised up here. This is what the house looked like.
My mother passed away a couple months ago, so I'm kind of glad that she's not here to see what happened. But, uh, yeah. been less than a month since this area burned. There's green leaves popping out all through the canopy of this forest. These trees are going to survive. They're going to be fine. So it's uh, a fire adapted ecosystem for sure. It's the houses that were not very fire adapted, unfortunately. Issues of community wildfire safety and forest ecosystem health led to the desire to do fuel treatment work. And so we've spent the last 25 years or so trying to work through that. And progress has definitely been made, but there's still work ahead of us. The car fire and the accumulative impacts of fires over the last you know decade of my living here in this really active fire environment where you deal with this acute stress every summer and it persists over months is you know it's hard to live with i just sort of back up to this is a generational problem right we created it over generations and so it's going to take generations to fix it <laughs> You know, my job in my lifetime is to make an increment of progress towards something better. The Watershed Center, you know, is an organization like many other community-based organizations that were born out of the Timber Wars. We came into our work with an idea that we could find this elegant solution that linked economic development with land stewardship. So we were raising money to run crews that are doing you know, thinning all around the county in partnership with the Forest Service and private landowners. We were getting cooperative agreements to do prescribed fire work in and around our communities. And so hearing Melanie talk to me about what she's doing after the wine country fires last year, and we're already talking about ideas about how we're gonna work together because we're doing this innovative prescribed fire work and now people in Sonoma County wanna do that same work. Like, I've got something to share. This one here is a perfect example. This is a trailer <laughs> blowout as okay. well. And so here you go, it starts racing on a west wind, right? Communities here, as high school, we're like here. But this isn't just a fuel treatment save the day. Yeah. yeah. You know, fire suppression still matters, preparedness, all those things, right? But this fire blows out, runs across town, looks like it's gonna be this conflagration runs head on into this prescribed fire treatment, mm -hmm. less than a, a year old, mm. and just lays down. Keep it Absolutely. literally cannot burn through that. And so it flanks, yeah. it lays down, yeah. they pick it up. Look, prescribed fire in this place yeah. makes the difference. That's a great and story. And if we can start reinforcing that with these overlapping and you know staggered polygons of fire, mm -hmm. you know, that actually- You gotta come tell that story in Sonoma County. <laughs> happily, happily. Yeah. This fuel complex that we're standing in the middle of is kind of a classic Western problem of a relatively open, high fire frequency forest that's now been partially logged and left fire free for decades. And you can see the result that's now choked full of second growth Douglas fir. So there are a lot of factors that have all kind of come together at the same time. Historical logging, grazing, and fire suppression allowed all these seedlings that had gotten established to grow up into the forest that has now gotten much more complex. It has big trees and small trees and 
live and dead fuels that can carry a surface fire from the ground all the way up into the canopy. But it's important to understand that there is a solution if we can just marshal the resources to get the work done. This is not an intractable problem. Put in three maple bars. Three maple bars? And three chocolate covered cake donuts. Okay, sounds in good. A, in a box for us? Yeah. Then why don't you put a couple of apple danish in there too? Okay, sounds good. For my wife, if we don't, maybe we'll get home with them, maybe we won't. How about two of the chocolate walnuts? I think we got enough for lunch. In terms of the frequent fire landscapes where we have created these unnatural accumulations of fuels, we certainly have the opportunity to do restoration in these, but we can't simply put fire back into them. Uh, most of them, uh, because it's been so long now since there's been fire in these, the accumulations of fuels are so great that we would not be able to control a fire if we tried to put fire back into those and everything would burn up just as it does with a wildfire. So what we need to do in many of these environments uh, is in fact go in and begin by mechanically reducing those fuels uh, by saw on the axe and removing that material where we can in order to help pay for the treatment that we're doing. Then it becomes possible to reintroduce fire or allow fire to reintroduce itself in those. One of the things that you do in one of these restoration treatments is obviously reduce the density of the forest and the amount of fuels that are present in it. Uh, what you leave behind are, uh, for example, the large fire-resistant pine trees and larch trees in these forests. That's what they've done here. Dramatically reduced the stand density, and they have retained uh, the oldest, largest pine trees that were present in this stand very important ecologically, and they're also the fire-resistant part of this forest. The neat thing here is we know what to do. It's just a question of whether we have the will to do it in terms of investing money and energy in restoring the fire-resistant condition. There are differences among the various environmental interest groups in terms of their attitude towards active management of forests. Nevertheless, many of the groups understand very clearly that it's time to end the timber wars and it's time to get back out there that in fact we need to be engaged with these forests. We need to be helping these forests. The forest wars have been such that nobody wins, and it's just sort of this war of attrition. You know, Mark's a, a pretty cerebral guy. He's, he's really smart, he's very articulate, and he eventually saw the writing on the wall, uh, and he didn't want his community to, you know, dry up and blow away, which was what was going to happen. You know, we want old growth and we want robust communities. Those are things that we all want, and there is a way to get there. And so those sorts of conversations started to develop on the Malheur with the Blue Mountains Forest Partners. The goal of the organization is to bring together stakeholders to develop large landscape restoration projects on the Malheur that are science-based and that also have a socioeconomic benefit to the local community. I talked to them years ago. I used to do a lot of animals. But we got a lot of big but young trees out there that are the wrong species, too we many of them, them all. and they gotta go. 
So there's plenty of volume to be taken off. It's yes. just not what historically we would have focused on. Correct. And it might require, require some market development and infrastructure right. retooling. Yeah. Learning curves. Learn, yes. Is that what? Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah. Five years in, Five it's like, years. oh, whoops, learning that's curve. A terrible way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just look at SJ as a partner that's moving things along in really good ways. <laughs> she and her husband bought a house here. They're good people. Prairie Wood closed uh, a number of years ago. Grant Western, which was an old growth Ponderosa pine mill, also closed, leaving only Malheur lumber. They're the only infrastructure that is anywhere in that part of the country. Uh, the nearest milling infrastructure is either down in southeast Oregon or in northeast Oregon. By and large, the industry in Eastern Oregon has shifted its attention and it's not as committed at all to going after the bigger trees. Malheur Lumber has retooled, which meant that they basically replaced all of their infrastructure that was designed to mill larger timber so that they could mill smaller diameter material. 18 to 23 is kind of their sweet spot and there are a lot of those kinds of trees out on the landscape that need to go for restoration purposes. And so they're well positioned to capitalize on the restoration that's happening on the forest. Restoration looks different depending on where you are. It looks different on the west side of the Cascades than it does on the east side. On the east side where we do have fire prone forests or frequent fire forests, the restoration generally looks like retaining the oldest, biggest trees that still remain. There's not a lot of them, but you start with those as the backbone of your restoration approach and then attempt to thin out the smallest trees that are ladder fuels and encourage the next generation of old growth trees to grow up as a result of sort of that succession process. Almost everyone is on board now. They may not be in 100% agreement, but everybody agrees that what's been going on needs to change. And that's what the collaboratives are all about. They are about developing a social consensus that then provides the license for the agency to move forward with the programs. We need to be doing a lot more restoration, which does include thinning and prescribed fire, than we are. The need is great, and we will never get there at the pace that we're going. There are a lot of barriers. The first is funding and staffing for the Forest Service. Forest Service is the biggest landowner in Eastern Oregon. They are not funded by Congress, and they are not staffed appropriately to put these kinds of projects together. They simply just don't have the money and they don't have the people to do it. It's such a small agency with such a large mission. The problems are not problems of attitude or technical information. The problem is insufficient budget and insufficient personnel to carry out what they're prepared to do. Uh, this is my 33rd fire season. The normal is starting to be uh, a fire season that starts earlier and ends way, way later. There's not really a non-fire season anymore. It seems like the fires are getting a lot larger. You know, normally we catch these fires at, you know, five, 10,000 acres. This is the Mendocino complex, and uh, it's one of the largest in, in California's history. beginning of the fire. A lot of the resources uh, were tied to the car fire in Redding, which had a lot of home loss. And so that was very important to um, have a lot of the resources there at the time.
There's 21 units in the state, and they've all been directed to do fuel reduction projects. And uh, we just got to catch up with it all. Wildfire suppression operations are really quite expensive. The U.S. Forest Service itself, as the world's largest firefighting organization, it is now spending a vast amount of its budget. Um, as high as 57% of the total budget was spent on, on fire-related activities. And to a certain extent, that was coming out of the other monies available for managing our lands. I mean, I always used to say that was kind of like telling the Coast Guard that you're not going to get to work because we spent your money on a hurricane. I mean, we wouldn't do that, and we shouldn't do that with forest managers. So that's where the fire fix came in. It was a recognition that you have a budget, an agency budget that's not stable, that is pulling funds away from those programs that need to be funded, whether it's for fire risk reduction or anything else. It accesses disaster funding and creates a new source of funding for a portion of suppression. So you have two pots of funding this flat level out of the normal appropriations process and everything above that comes out of this new disaster fund. So you stabilize the Forest Service budget. The fire funding fix is a big deal and we're very, very proud of it. Um, but now we have the next step that we need to do. We need to invest in all the proven work to support community efforts that are so vital that we need so we can learn about how to be fire adapted communities. Federal Forest Service lands up there. Some pretty neat stuff up in Minnesota. The Forest Service estimates that 80 million acres of its 193 million acre land base is in need of some sort of restoration because it is at risk of uh, catastrophic wildfire or insect and disease outbreaks. We need to be focusing on a restoration economy and approach, and we need to be making sure that you know, we can reduce the wildfires that we've seen and protect our homes and our communities and the resources we care about. But that's not to, to suggest it's gonna be an easy fix. A lot of the material that comes off of these forests is very small, it is very low value, and there's a lack of markets for it. So we are going to need to continue to have innovation and investment to make sure that we can remove that material for environmental purposes, not just for markets and economies. Uh, but they can definitely go hand in hand, and as we grow those markets, we're able to process and use more of that, and that helps us get more work done on the ground. Vaughan Brothers were one of the first mills that saw the writing on the wall, and they retooled their mills and got extremely efficient. So a lot of these trees that are being thinned to improve forest health are now going to that mill and creating wood products that we can buy in communities in the Northwest. We're talking about millions of acres of problems, which means millions and millions of tons of material that need to come out. We need scalable solutions. So this is where the logs come in from the log yard. The logs go from here right to the new saw and turn into lumber very quickly. So the technology shift from basically taking a big log and whittling away from the outside and, and just cutting high quality boards all the way in to a small diameter log that was centered in the machine, that was kind of the technological shift that happened. So as the logs come through here, he's just watching for all the different operations, making sure the flow works through the process. And then as that log comes through the machine, it gets positioned properly, and the important part in this process is that the logs are perfectly centered through there, and then they need to be turned properly so you get not only the most volume out of each log, but that it's cut with the grain properly so it lays flat. So when somebody goes to build with it, it's actually a straight piece of lumber. To actually use the significant volume 
of small diameter, low value wood coming off of federal forest lands is going to require a lot of innovation in new markets. It's firewood, it's wood chips, it's biomass energy, electricity and heating uh, that can offset fossil fuels. It's also really advanced high value wood products like mass timber, cross laminated timber that take a lot of this small diameter material and actually creates large engineered wood products. Mass timber is a building process where we're using high-tech adhesives and processes to glue lumber together. And once that glue dries, the glue is actually stronger than the wood. So it's kind of like weaving the wood together. Not only does that add value to those products, but it allows us to use wood in new ways, like building skyscrapers out of wood. Uh, and that creates a lot of environmental and public benefits, because not only are we using this wood and restoring the health of our forests, but we're reducing carbon emissions uh, by building with wood in our communities instead of concrete or steel. A lot of that we've seen with the farm to table movement with food. People are really concerned about where their food comes from, how it was grown, who grew it, what processes went into it, is it safe, is it healthy? How often do you ask that question about the paper that you use or the wood that's in your house, but it's just as important. And so we're starting to tell the story and connect the public with their wood products and actually trying to create a holistic circle where they can actually understand where their resources come from and continue to support those economies and get more work done on the ground. You would get into great difficulties if you turned over uh, the management of these forests just to people who fought fire and were concerned with fuels. If you focus on a single outcome, such as fuel loadings, uh, you tend to marginalize other important values such as wildlife habitat, for example. You need to have uh, interdisciplinary groups that are designing these restoration programs. We're gonna have prescribed fire here at Sonoma County Regional Parks right here in Sonoma Valley. Pretty excited about that. Uh, it'll really feel sweet by two o'clock this oh, afternoon. Yeah, exactly. So if it does get across that road down there, we'll have to pick that up just so we don't impact the, okay. the power poles. Yeah, hey, Cal Fire, you guys can integrate, you know, with the local government here. You guys don't have to hang out and, like, <laughs> separate pockets. <laughs> now, also, we have an anticipated ignition sequence on the map shown by numbers and arrows. Steve and I will be communicating as he's at point A1, he's putting fire on the ground. Point A2, et cetera. Any questions so far? Exciting! I didn't know what the shroud was for until the fire got lit. I was like, oh, it's to keep smoke out of your lungs. <laughs> it feels like the first ignition is kind of the iffiest because you just don't know. Because that's how I felt when you guys first ignited. Yeah. I was a little nervous because I was yeah. like, I don't know where this is going to go. Yeah. But then once you Neither see the friends. <laughs> yeah, right? You just get into this like nonverbal communication and you're like in the flow. And it's just, a, it's an awesome feeling. You just know that person needs water or that person needs you to scrape and, uh, and you're not even talking. 
you know, we kind of had amnesia here in Sonoma County until all the fires of October 2017. And now we've woken up and we know that we have to have a little bit of smoke and controlled fire before we get a mega fire coming through here. So it's really exciting to me. We're turning the corner. I've known this girl since like elementary school, but we were never really friends. So when her house burned down, everyone was like, my condolences, like this is really sad and all of this. And my family was of course like, you know, do you need anything? Like, can we help you? And she was like, yeah, I want to live with you. And we were like, because we didn't know her that well or anything. She ended up being like, the best friend I've ever had. And we kept on being like, man, this is crazy. Like, this never would have happened if your house didn't burn down. <laughs> All right, do you guys know what you'd like to order? Oh, yeah. All right, what can I have for you? We're going to continue to fight fire, but fire is also going to escape control. And it's there that we need to try to create the conditions that will allow the fires that do escape control to burn without catastrophic ecological damage. The resilience of the landscape and the resilience of the community are the same thing. <laughs> They're not people in nature. My experience has been that you can make a difference and uh, what you do and what you learn and what you practice can make a difference. It makes me very, very grateful. And so the people who are willing to think outside of those silos and find the new way, that's the fellowship, that's, that's all of us. You know, you gotta be able to pick your head up every once in a while and like hear other people's stories and have kind of shared purpose. But in truth, a generational problem, if you wanna make progress on it, takes sacrifice. So 2017 was the first big fire to hit Santa Rosa in a very long time, 60 plus years. And 2020, we already had the Wallbridge fire. Everyone just repopulated, and now we have this glass fire complex on the east side of town. So a stubborn fire uh, substantially impacted because of that five-year historic drought. It looks like a war zone. The whole city is quiet. A lot of it's out of power. You know, almost no one slept last night. I think people here are very fatigued. Very fatigued, yeah. My 86-year-old mom with lung conditions came at midnight last night. She was under evacuation order. And you can see the fire from our neighborhood up on the ridge top. In the distance, this is from my neighborhood. If anything goes wrong, you go to Zach's or you get the pets and you go to the Slater Field, basically. Okay. Does that make sense? And yeah. you've got your phone charged. With each repeated event, People are going, oh, this is not a one-off. This is not an accident. But I think we are turning the corner with people's awareness. Basically just starting to get ready. I've got the important papers. Um, I've got my firefighting stuff. If we end up getting drawn into the response. These patterns are here to stay for the foreseeable future and we need to prepare for it to save people's lives. So the story's not over here in Santa Rosa. Thank you.